All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today, both in the room and also somewhere in the ceiling. Um, we're really excited to host this conversation launching Data Sovereignty from the Digital Silk Road to the Return of the State, which is a new open access volume by uh, Anna Pomchander and Hao Chen Sun, who we're excited to have joining us today. We also have copies up front if people are hoping to flip through after the event. Um, and to briefly introduce the authors, uh, Anna Pom is the Scott K. Ginsburg Professor of Law and Technology at Georgetown University, uh, the author of The Electronic Silk Road, and most importantly, a visiting scholar at the Institute for Rebooting Social Media uh, this year. And Hao Chen is a professor of law at the University of Hong Kong Faculty of Law, uh, and an expert on intellectual property, technology law, and Chinese law. He's also the author of Technology and the Public Interest, which was the topic of another great BKC panel last year. So excited to have you back, Hao Chen. Thank you. And we're extremely lucky to have Chen Maiyi Arun in conversation with the authors today. Uh, Chin Maiyi is the Executive Director of the Information Society Project and a lecturer in law and research scholar at Yale Law School. Uh, her research focuses on platform governance, social media, algorithmic decision making, the data economy and privacy, all within the larger universe of questions raised by law's relationship with the information society. So there's truly no one better um, that we could have gotten to moderate this conversation today. And with that, I'll hand it over to Chin Maiyi. Um, firstly, as I was telling Anupam when he reached out, I couldn't be more privileged or honored, honored to be the one that gets to do this. Um, and it's very special because actually when I met Anupam, he was in Delhi launching the electronic silk road. So, so I love the full circle that this makes and you all know that Berkman is where I started my time at the US, so it's always been very special to me. Um, we just spent a wonderful week in January discussing some, some related questions at Howard's wonderful conference at HKU, um, and so this really it couldn't be more special. I am so grateful um, that you've invited me here to do this. I am going to get to it because I have committed to getting through as many of my questions as I can for the in the first half an hour, so that you can talk to the authors. I will not be selfish and keep it you. And so I am proceeding assuming that many of you have not read the book, and so I'm going to ask questions that have been answered in it to give you a teaser of what is in it, because I promise you will want to read it. Anupam and Hachan, without further ado, in your introduction, you have a wonderful line that I think says a lot about this book. Um, you say, when Thomas Hobbes imagined an artificial man in the form of a state, he was not picturing Facebook. And then you, you go on to define digital sovereignty. Can you tell the audience how you define digital sovereignty and why you came to this definition? Great. Um, well, first of all, um, I want to extend my great thanks to Chin Maiyi for to Professor Arun for uh, joining us here. I've admired her for a decade, uh, and so from that uh, the meeting in Delhi uh, to many meetings uh, across the world. Um, so so happy to, to, that you could uh, join us here today. Um, so I, I, the other thing I want to do is uh, tell the audience: do not buy this book. Um, and so the book can be downloaded for free online. Yes. Uh, OUP is charging prices really for libraries. I don't know why libraries insist on buying this book. Um, it actually did chart on some Amazon charts for a little bit. I mean, these are very narrow, you know, uh, law charts. And I was like, who is buying this book? <laughs> so <laughs> you could press the download button. Uh, so please, uh, the, the poster for this has uh, a QR code, uh, which is the downward, uh, da download link. Uh, and I know that QR codes are kind of dangerous in many ways, but this is legit. <laughs> okay, uh, okay. Uh, so uh, returning to uh, your question, Chinmayi. So the reference to Hobbes is intended to invoke the image of Leviathan, uh, which of course Hobbes used to reference the state. Uh, and so, uh, and many people have decided, have noted that uh, there are a handful of companies today that have Leviathan-like powers uh, that kind of bestride the world, you know, in the way that uh, kind of Hobbes described the state. And so um, there's a kind of artificial man here in the form of this uh, giant corp these giant corporations. 
uh, and so uh, they, which rival the power of states. And to a large extent, the assertion of digital sovereignty or data sovereignty uh, is an attempt to uh, wrestle these leviathans uh, to the ground, bring them down to earth, and hold them to account for domestic law. Okay. So at that level, I think it's, uh, it's a truly understandable and natural response to the emergence of these, uh, these uh, giant corporations. Um, and uh, so in that sense, it's an effort to bring uh, the digital world within uh, democratic uh, constraints. Um, and in, in our book, we define digital sovereignty as simply the application of traditional state sovereignty to this digital or online domain. Uh, and including the companies, including in that context, the companies that create and provide services in this digital domain. So the fact is that you know, the company could be based in the Caribbean or the United States or China, and we're going to hold it to account in our jurisdiction regardless. Okay. So I think in that sense, digital sovereignty is a natural uh, and, and critical part of what it means to have uh, popular sovereignty. So it's directly linked to popular sovereignty in that way, uh, to democracy. Uh, and much of my own writing is very much animated by, you know, thinking about popular sovereignty. Uh, and so uh, what it means in the kind of digital domain uh, today. At the same time, I want to say the book is also concerned about uh, the way that control over the digital domain whether exercised by Mark Zuckerberg or president or premier or, uh, or uh, governor general X, um, can itself raise different uh, uh, concerns. And so this is, uh, this is so we need to be uh, mindful about the way that it's governed, um, the way that we uh, assert control over it whether it's done from the, uh, by, uh, by uh, Elon or Mark uh, or Sundar or whomever it is, or uh, take your uh, uh, politician that you are most concerned about uh, and substitute them in that, in any of those names. So, so, and, uh, so I think that, and I just want to make a distinction here also in the book, we, we had a lot of trouble actually, is this, are we talking about digital sovereignty? Are we talking about data sovereignty? Yeah. The book title is has kind of both in it, um, and uh, the uh, the book uh, is uses more digital sovereignty than data sovereignty, uh, and so it kind of goes back and forth. I think one can usefully distinguish data sovereignty and digital sovereignty, but they become very hard to disaggregate uh, once you press the concepts. Uh, so if you really say, you know, you're focused on controlling data flows or the, what data can move in the country, that immediately calls up speech and content regulation, um, which is often not things that we think about when we think about data sovereignty. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I've written a lot about cross-border flows of data, uh, which really are another way to see, see uh, information sharing across borders, right? Um, and so suddenly it raises all these issues that are in a totally different domain than we think of as traditional data regulation. So, so I found the two concepts which can be differentiated to be, uh, it's, I think it's, I think it's better to think of them as inextricably linked uh, and not try to make such a big distinction between the two. Because uh, on, you know, when, when you press them, uh, they kind of merge uh, in, in a particular way. And you see governments that kind of use both uh, concepts. And I did searches within uh, government uh, uses of the term, you know, when does the U.S. government use the term uh, data sovereignty or digital sovereignty? 
the amusing thing I found in this context is that when the U.S. government uses the term, it simply uses the term to reference European Union's approach <laughs> to the internet. Brussels uh, effect. <laughs> it is the Brussels effect in that way, right? Uh, and what we describe in the book is that the U.S. never had to worry about data sovereignty or digital sovereignty because we had it from the very start. Because the companies were based here, we, you know, even when a company would be based in the Caribbean, we prosecute the American who ran that company when he transited through, when he made the mistake of transiting through JFK or, or picked, it, picked him up in Costa Rica. Uh, Etc. We would, we would, our, our uh, FBI was very good at figuring out your movements across the world and, and gathering you from uh, wherever you were. If you, if we thought you were running afoul of U.S. law, uh, we prosecuted uh, a Russian uh, who came uh, to DEFCON uh, to share some uh, information about how he had kind of created a system to allow access to Adobe eBooks um, early on because he, uh, because he was allowing you to violate, uh, you know, DMCA uh, controls on, uh, on uh, copyrighted material. Uh, he said he was just allowing, and this will be of interest to folks interested in disability questions, he said he was just allowing uh, disabled people to access these eBooks. Uh, and so but we picked him up in, when he arrived in Las Vegas. Uh, and so we had da data sovereignty, digital sovereignty from the start, whether it was a Russian company or it was a Caribbean company or an American company. Uh, we insisted on it from the start. So I'll, I'll leave it at that and, uh, and come back to these questions. So, sorry. So, so I'm going to end my our turn also to pitch in, but I'm just I'm going to layer in my second question, which is that I know that both of you have been friends for a long time, yeah. and that you work together. But I want to invite you to peel back the co-authorial veil and talk a little bit about why you decided to write this book together, um, and how you came to an agreement about what digital sovereignty, data sovereignty means, because you come from such different backgrounds and countries that do things in, in different ways. Um, so if I can invite you to respond to that. Thank you. Uh, so first of all, I also want to thank uh, Berkman Klein Center for hosting today's book launch. Uh, you know, uh, as some of you know, I gave a talk on my book, uh, Technology and Public Interest, last year here, right here. So it's so great to uh, uh, to uh, be back at Berkman Klein Center. And I also want to thank uh, uh, Professor Arun uh, for joining us. Uh, uh, commenting and uh, discussing uh, about this book with us today. Uh, so, um, as you can immediately tell, Anupong is the scholar who knows this subject matter best in the entire world. So, there's no question for me that, uh, you know, I never had a doubt about, you know, whether we should collaborate or not, but it's just, uh, you know, flows so naturally. He's the, as I said, he. He's the scholar who uh, mastered this subject matter, uh, and uh, so there. But there, actually, there is a long story that I would like to uh, 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 share with you about uh, you know how we come together to uh, collaborate on this project. So it actually it started uh, from a trip, this grand trip that Anupam made back in 2019, before the pandemic. Uh, so he uh, paid a visit to uh, the greater China area, uh, covering Hong Kong and China. And uh, so he first arrived in Hong Kong and uh, we met, and then we decided to uh, go to Shenzhen, which is right next to uh, Hong Kong. And then there are a lot of you know, uh, uh, tech companies uh, in Shenzhen. So um, we went through the borders, physical borders, and due to uh, physical sovereignty, due to physical sovereignty first. Then at the immigration, um, so we, I, uh, you know, uh, cleared the immigration very quickly, but then uh, I waited for Anupong for such a long time, you know, I wondered whether Anupong could uh, actually go through the China's immigration and uh, actually, you know, we could make this visit to multiple tech companies, uh, you know, visit possible. Probably we waited for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, something like that. So 
that was the the moment that we dealt with this kind of physical or traditional sovereignty. China's exercising you know sovereignty over this great scholar. You know, I I I am not sure how many questions you received from the officer at the immigration. But anyway, uh, so we first dealt with the this kind of uh, physical sovereignty first when we were visiting Shenzhen, but then. We, we were, you know, uh, we were lucky that, you know, uh, Alipon made it through and then we uh, went to visit Tencent and uh, also a bunch of other tech companies. And people there were so eager asking me and uh, Alipon a range of questions about how they should deal with cross-border uh, flow of uh, data, for example, how they deal with data localization in China, but then if they want to do business, outside of China, for example, in South uh, Asia, for example, the PN technology folks ask us a range of questions about how, uh, for example, uh, how they uh, look, uh, store data in the Philippines, countries like that, you know, how they should deal with, uh, you know, uh, another kind of sovereignty, uh, let's say called it as uh, Anupong explained, a data or digital sovereignty. So then we uh, had such vibrant discussion with tech folks there uh, in Shenzhen. So after our visit, we uh, sat down to talk about uh, uh, various issues that we dealt with during the visit. And then Alupa was still struggling with jet lag. <laughs> so, uh, but then immediately after we talked about collaboration, this potential conference, he suddenly, you know, became so alert. <laughs> so that was a fantastic moment, you know, uh, we had in Shenzhen, of course we had such fun, you know, uh, tasty food, right? That I'm sure you can still recall that this kind of delicate dumplings, dumpling was, you know, sea cucumber that we had in Shenzhen, you know. But then, it, it, you know, when we started talking about collaboration, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, Alupo suddenly overcame jet lag, and we talked about how we should uh, deal with this project, you know. Immediately we thought of, uh, you know, uh, hosting a conference together in Hong Kong, because this is, a hub where we could, uh, you know, put together so many scholars. And Hong Kong is really the hub for international travels. Um, so then we planned. But then, it, as you know, the next year, uh, the pandemic, you know, uh, uh, you know, arrived. So uh, then we decided to, but we still wanted to do this conference. How could we do it, right? Okay. So we decided to co-host the conference. Uh, no, by the way, it was conference co-hosted co by my school, HKU Faculty of Law, and your school, Georgetown University Law Center. So we decided to move this event uh, online. Uh, so it became a virtual event. But we were so fortunate that we got two keynote speeches, one delivered by uh, Professor Mark Wu, um, uh, the, uh, uh, a professor here at HK, uh, uh, Harvard Law School, and then another keynote delivered by uh, Frank Pasquale, who is now a professor at Cornell Law School at Cornell Tech. And um, we also put together uh, so many scholars, and if you're interested, you can see uh, their speeches, uh, you know, in the book. Uh, so, um, and uh, so we uh, hosted the conference uh, online, and then, uh, and then it took us, um, how, how many years? Two years or so to put, everything together, because it, it was so hard to putting things together through the pandemic. Um, people were yeah, so I was just slow. I, yeah. It was me. It was all me. <laughs> <laughs> but we we're so glad, you know, everything came through. And this is the book, as uh, Anupong pointed out, uh, you know, um, uh, you don't need to buy the book. It's, um, you know, we've uh, arranged open access. Um, so, uh, uh, and, uh, as to the question about how we reach the consensus of concerning uh, various issues, especially the concept of data sovereignty, I feel like there is no disagreement between the uh, two of us because, you know, Anupong, uh, as uh, you know, uh, you uh, mentioned, uh, you guys mentioned that a uh, conference uh, hosted uh, uh, in, in India, right? Okay, so actually, we I first met. Anupan here at Harvard Law School, although he was not my professor um, and, uh, when he was visiting uh, at various law schools, but he, uh, you know, uh, he uh, picked my paper on this uh, the social justice IP uh, for this uh, uh, 
Harvard and International Junior Scholars Conference. So uh, that one was hosted uh, at Harvard Law School. So we actually got to know each other many years ago, and uh, we have talked about so many things, ranging from intellectual property to tech law, and um, uh, Anupam cares about international trade and that international law and liberal democracy so much. And I feel like I have so much, uh, uh, you know, we, we have so much in common. So um, we actually did not have any disagreement. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, but, but we talked about various kinds of things, uh, you know, whether, for example, the book title, whether it should be uh, the sovereignty or the sovereignty. Uh, but anyway, uh, um, it was, we had a, a range of discussion instead of having, you know, uh, various kinds of disagreements. Can I just say one, just a little, you know, it's really interesting because there's a lot of criticism of China in our, in the two chapters that we wrote in this book. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, uh, some of that criticism comes from me that I penned. Um, and I wasn't really sure, um, you know, how it would be for a scholar, uh, you know, who's based in China uh, to participate in these, in, in that, uh, and to put his name to some of this criticism. Uh, and it's been fascinating that it, that hasn't been an issue. Um, I, I hope, I don't, I don't want to make it an issue, but it's just, uh, just as you're thinking about these collaborations, uh, as you're thinking of collaborations you know, across uh, you know, fraught uh, you know, uh, political circumstances, uh, it is uh, you know, something to navigate. In, you know, and I think for, for, for us, it's been very fruitful, and I've, I've learned a lot from Hao Chen, uh, and uh, but but I, I know that there's a lot of nervousness around around this question, especially in the United States and and China. Yeah, I remember that when we were uh, sort of putting together the, the chapters uh, in back in 2021, uh, that was the year in which uh, DD uh, China's uh, you know uh, you know the the, the the China's equivalent to Uber here uh, was about to go public. Uh, in uh, New York, and but then the the, the this uh, deal was so you know halted by uh, the Chinese government, and we talked about this it's kind of scary moment uh, and how we should deal with uh, this subject matter in our book. And we're so fortunate fortunate that we uh, I think we talked about this uh, you know uh, drama in uh, in our uh, intro, and uh, we also have contributors dealing with such uh, you know, important issue as well. Yeah, that was the launch of the uh, Chinese tech crackdown. Mm -hmm. The DD move was, you know, basically demolished a, a trillion dollars of uh, market cap of Chinese tech companies, that and, and, uh, and shortly thereafter, other moves. So very interesting to watch uh, as China went after its own companies uh, during that process. Thank you. That's a wonderful answer. And it also, a lot of my friends ask, say that it's hard to tell where your friendships end and where your collaborations begin. And I'm like, it's, it's, it is hard to tell because they're all intertwined. So thank you. That was wonderful. It was nuanced. I had a China question, but I'm going to hold it in case other people do. And I feel like you answered half of it already. So I'm going to ask you my broader question. And then after that, maybe we could have a conversation with the audience, which is that the book, I love that it discusses many kinds of sovereignty, um, state, territorial sovereignty, discuss companies, data sovereignty. Um, but in my work, I've been reading a little bit and thinking a little bit about how to break outside territorial democracy in, in including people's voice and in giving people some. Um, where would you say this, this idea of uh, democracy and the people fits in this, in this sort of geopolitical? So let me begin. Um, you know, I mentioned popular sovereignty earlier as kind of a, a through line in much of my work. Um, by the way, this, you know, uh, Terry and the professors will appreciate this all goes back to what I 
thought about and what the seminars I took when I was in law school. I took a seminar with Akhil Lamar on popular sovereignty. <laughs> and so I still that that issue is uh, at, at the, you know, uh, various seminars or uh, moments in my in my law school education uh, really animate my work, you know. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to tell you how many decades later. Um, but uh, uh, so, I, you know, this is obviously a critical thing. I began in your first question by responding that this, you know, we had these new Leviathans, um, and this was a way to for uh, countries to assert themselves vis-a-vis -vis these Leviathans. I should also note that there are also small players. So, uh, you know, one of the worries that I have about internet regulation is that when governments regulate, they regulate based often with five companies in mind. Um, they think of the internet as really five companies, and the internet is far more complicated than that. Uh, and so I think it's important to think about uh, uh, smaller companies as well. But what we see, I think, it, digital sovereignty is an expression it, it very much of popular sovereignty in that way. Um, uh, and so, uh, so I think it's necessary. And so, uh, you know, I have, uh, I think it's, it's, but I also, you know, we, in, the, in the book, we say it's both necessary and dangerous. Um, it's both uh, critical for, for popular sovereignty and it's bet noir because it can, that kind of control, the control that you can get through territorial control and digital control is a combination that is an incredibly powerful uh, mix. Uh, and so, I think we should be very cautious about about that, right? There's a kind of totalitarianism that's possible today that really, you know, would have been uh, the hope of many totalitarians in, in the past. So I think we need to be very cautious about this. In the book, we also uh, have uh, our concern that this is not just a, a warning to uh, to traditional uh, to governments that we traditionally view as authoritarian. Uh, so what I what I want to do also in uh, in the book is really kind of you know not just simply say there's a uh, a northern ethical tech regulation and a southern unethical tech regulation. Uh, I want to avoid that kind of framing. Uh, and so basically to say you know. Ethical and unethical tech regulation occurs in all domains, uh, and we should be cautious about it everywhere. Uh, we should be critical about it uh, in China and in the United States, etc. That's I'm not trying to make, draw a false equivalence. I think there's certainly you know uh, different worries that one might have and things like that. Uh, but I think we need to be cautious about it. And let me give, give you a, a couple examples. Um, so this last summer uh, there was a uh, police killing, it, you know, that I don't know if many people followed here in the United States, but a police killing in Paris of a 17 year old immigrant from uh, a 17 year old who was a descendant of North African immigrants. Okay, a boy. Uh, and the police said, you know, he was threatening, etc. Video then later uh, arrived that su suggested that the police did not appear to be under threat. You know, I'm not saying I know definitively what you know what the story is, uh, but there was a serious questioning of the police account uh, that video made possible. Um, and in the wake of that, there was rioting, uh, and police uh, men and women were injured uh, in Paris, uh, etc., in other jurisdictions. So, uh, and the French state, uh, you know, so you had you know uh, uh, President Macron. Uh, really kind of saying, hey, you know, it's the tech platforms that are causing the rioting. Uh, and so, you know, uh, there was an effort to, uh, and he named tech platforms, Snapchat, uh, uh, TikTok, uh, where the, where the, you know, one, one, pro, one cause of the rioting. Um, when one might have wondered whether or not there were other possible reasons for uh, the uh, population to to express itself in this way. I'm not pro-rioting, etc., uh, but the question here is, 
you know, so what happens next? What, so what, what does TikTok do? What does Snapchat do in response? Well, you've got this new uh, law coming on the books, now on the books, the Digital Services Act, uh, which wasn't on the books then. Uh, by the way, it, during, that, it, during the course of those conversations, he said, you know, we could ban these platforms, okay, floating the idea, okay. The DSA, the Digital Services Act, doesn't have a ban uh, sanction available, but a temporary suspension sanction available. But I don't think that's actually even the real threat. Uh, but uh, there are other uh, sanctions within that system that basically allow the government to say, hey, we don't like what you're doing. Um, and so, uh, so what do you do if you're TikTok or, or you're Snapchat? This isn't your issue, perhaps, you know, uh, you know uh, on, on any particular issue. You simply, you know, steer the algorithm in a particular way so that you don't come, on, you know, you don't uh, cause any problems with the local authorities uh, and lead to, uh, you know, adverse consequences within uh, the political system. Um, so I think those things, you know, we should be watchful about that as well. We should make sure that if there are, you know, I have a, a, a paper on the DSA, which uh, I suggest uh, needs more. Uh, it doesn't have enough checks and balances built into it. Doesn't have enough. It has a lot of powers, but not enough uh, protections uh, built into it. And I think we need to be thinking about uh, these things uh, in a variety of ways. And then let me just say, this morning, uh, the uh, Biden administration sanctioned uh, a, a group called. Uh, it's called uh, Intellexus. Uh, sorry, I wrote it down. There. <laughs> um, uh, it sanctioned a company called uh, Intellexus, Intellexa uh, Consortium, okay. mm -hmm. which turns out, because why? Because Intellexa is selling uh, surveillance as a service. Um, and, it's, and a lot of these companies turn out to be based in Europe. Okay. This is a Greek company that's selling surveillance as a service. Uh, and so, um, so the worry is that, you know, it's selling it indiscriminately and it's being used to target dissidents in, in various ways uh, across the world. And I think uh, Western governments need to do a lot more uh, because we properly complain about Chinese companies selling authoritarian technology in Africa and elsewhere. And I think that's, that's exactly right. But we should also be very concerned when you can buy uh, tools that can hack your iPhone, uh, et cetera. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and these are Western companies doing it. Uh, and the European, I haven't seen the European regulators act on these questions, basically at all. Uh, and so you see, uh, so there's a lot of European action against American companies. Maybe they should also be looking within their own borders as uh, to what's going on. This is exactly why I enjoy the book and enjoy your work so much. It is a complete picture. It asks all of these questions that I'm always eager to know the answers to. So as you can imagine, I have many more questions, but I don't want to be selfish. So I'm now going to invite the audience to ask questions. And if you don't have any, then I will run through mine. <laughs> but I, I cannot believe that you don't have any. Well, I might selfishly uh, jump in with one as well. Um, I, I, the, the picture of these, these uh, the return of the state to wrestle these leviathans, I think is a really compelling one. And I'd just love to hear your thoughts of uh, maybe about trends that have emerged over the last, since you've, you've put the book together and, and started working on the book, of states uh, exerting power to, to uh, create national champions in the context of cloud infrastructure or AI. So not just to assert control over these foreign digital presences, but rather to create um, national capacities to, uh, to assert some sort of independence and, and to create or to, to prevent reliance on, on foreign um, sort of sources of those services and, and whatever else. So I'd love your thoughts about that different sort of emergence of the state in the last couple of years. Um, so I'll, I'll begin quickly. Um, uh, so, by the way, in my own mind, I always think of uh, the other book that I, I go to is, of course, Gulliver's Travels uh, with the Leviathan, who is, uh, you know, not actually uh, that big uh, in, in, in his own land, but when he travels to another land, uh, quite enormous. Uh, and then it's tiny uh, Lilliputians who try to uh, uh, 
uh, wrestle him down to the ground. Um, and uh, in some sense, that is, uh, that is partly what's going on. But your question is with respect to uh, the effort to create national champions. One of the striking things about the Chinese actions was how they were really focused on their own national champions. It was Tencent that got hit. It was uh, Didi, which you know, was um, on its way to incredible success until it suddenly wasn't until it became, you know, desperately fighting for survival, um, et cetera. So it just fascinating to see, and I think, you know, we can, I'd love to hear from Hao Chen a little bit more about why he thinks that happened with the, uh, with the tech crackdown in, in China in particular. Uh, but the desire to build an indigenous uh, tech ecosystem is, uh, is uh, shared across the world. Uh, no one wants to be reliant entirely on uh, uh, U.S.-based companies or Chinese-based companies. My worry in this context is that sometimes when governments essentially act in protectionist ways, so, you know, I did, I studied a lot of economic development, which in the goal of economic development for, for many decades in the last half, uh, in much of the 20th century, uh, the the goal was to replace foreign enterprise with domestic enterprise. Um, and that often was a failure. Uh, and so we, I think it's, you know, that history should be a caution for this effort uh, because it turned out to raise costs for the rest of enterprise that depended upon those particular things. In the United States today, if you build uh, uh, so we're trying to put in, uh, 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 you know, huge uh, semiconductor plants, etc. Turns out that uh, and battery plants. When Panasonic is building these things, it needs a lot of steel. Uh, and by the way, you have to now buy American steel, uh, and that makes it very hard for Panasonic to actually build the battery plants um, in in the United States. Uh, so you know, we're trying to help steel workers on one side, but we're har harming a huge swath of industry on the other side. So I think we should be cautious about that. And I think, uh, so I am nervous about the national champions model of economic development. I do think everyone, everyone should figure out how can we best empower our, our, uh, our domestic industry and have, have them benefit from these things. Uh, but I'm, I'm very concerned about uh, the protectionism that is uh, that is uh, very popular. And there's an easy logic to protectionism, but that history doesn't really, history doesn't bear it out as a very successful strategy. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, so let me quickly talk about China, because uh, it is absolutely a strategy that ch this uh, so-called national champion uh, strategy that China has been uh, so, you know, adopted and applied. And as Anwar pointed out, that these big companies such as Tencent, Didi, are the best examples. Uh, but I think that the, chi the landscape in China is very complicated. And uh, uh, you know, nowadays it's easy to sort of portray China as a sort of this kind of state or government oriented regulation of uh, or tech development of uh, tech. But you know, for the, on the other hand, we have the United States, which you know, follow this kind of market-based approach, and then in the European Union, it has kind of a rights-based approach, uh, exemplified by the GDPR. But this kind of this conventional uh, or uh, a conventional portrayal of China might be a little bit kind of narrow-minded. I think uh, I would I would say that actually the tech development in China started from this kind of market-oriented model in the very uh, first place, for example, the rise of Tencent, the rise of Alibaba, or began with this kind of market practice. For example, Alibaba is an e-commerce platform, right? E-commerce means that you buy things through, uh, you know, uh, the platforms such as Alibaba, you know, through voluntary transactions, market-oriented practice, you know, contract-based transactions. And also Tencent, for example, is an example about you know this kind of providing uh, chatting apps or services, and uh, you know, and then later on, 
gaming and advertisement, and Tencent is known for offering services like that. So the, the rapid growth of these tech companies shows that at the very beginning, China followed this kind of market-oriented approach, especially when China opened its door to the rest of the world, it needs you know, international investment or foreign investment. So um, I would say that you know, we, we need to have a, this kind of historical review of tech development in China first. The, the, some of the development of tech in China following this kind of market-oriented uh, practices. But then later on, there is this kind of strange development. Um, for example, um, <clears throat> I would say this market-oriented approach is also so, you know, governed by or so, you know, coupled with a uh, state orient uh, you know regulation. I think the best little example is the kind of great firewall that China uh, has it you know so you know, exerted in, in, in the country, uh, which means that uh, so several you know major tech companies such as Google and Facebook are not allowed to do business in Ch in China because of this great firewall practice. And at the same time, Chinese citizens could not have access to uh, information that you know uh, is displayed uh, outside this great firewall. Okay, uh, but that one that practice actually was very good for Chinese companies because it walled off competition from uh, international uh, companies such as Google and Facebook. So within China. You can see that the the, the market orient uh, you know uh, you know arrangement and at the same time the government's uh, intervention actually at the very beginning you know helped tech companies uh, although it you know in the, the many foreigners eyes these uh, great firewall practices were totally you know anti market uh, you know a based economy or it you know it was you know or is still authoritarian. So that's the very early stage, I would say. But then later on, you can see that you know, Chinese government target is has started targeting, um, um, you know, big or the national champions, as you pointed out, you know, earlier. Uh, so that's another shift uh, 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 that China has, uh, you know, sort of witnessed. And I would say this, uh, we still have this this kind of you know, market oriented, uh, you know, so you know. Practices, but at the same time, there has been more and more of state intervention, but not only targeting uh, foreign tech companies, but also um, uh, dealing with uh, uh, you know national uh, tech companies as well. I think there is a one easy way to understand uh, this major shift. This is because the Chinese government wanted to have more, uh, so you know. You know, so one single voice within the country, uh, you know, which will be better, uh, which will make the government better off when they, so you know, uh, you know, operate this kind of authoritarian uh, regime, and they realize that you know this kind of tech regulation is necessarily uh, you know needed if they wanted to assert that power because. It is the tech companies or social media platforms nowadays that uh, deal with you know speech regulation, and, uh, as well as uh, the control of opinions that could be uh, so you know so powerful for governmental regulation. I think the Chinese uh, government learned so much from the uh, two thousand eleven and two thousand and. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the competition between, uh, I think it, it was 2016 uh, presidential election, the competition between uh, Hillary and uh, Trump. Social media such, played such a major role in sort of deciding the outcome of the election. Um, for example, the, the, the rise of the fake news, you know, the, the use of social media you know, platforms to uh, advocate, you know, uh, uh, various kind of, you know, voices. So I, I believe that the Chinese government learned such a big lesson from uh, the U.S., uh, you know, presidential election, and they wanted to, uh, 
uh, also exert uh, you know a tighter control of big tech as well. Okay, so there are various reasons why you can see that kind of big uh, shift. But then again, the the rise of the tech war or trade war between China and the United States also kind of you know, started to shape uh, you know this kind of national champion strategy. And then the story again is very complicated. <laughs> um, so you can see that, for example, starting from the chip war, uh, U.S. ban on so you know uh, exporting chips to China, it actually so you know um, so it sounded the awakening uh, you know uh, moment in China. We you know people realized or the government realized that we, they couldn't really rely upon foreign export. So. This kind of fostering of national uh, champions is absolutely important, but you know that it's so hard to make you know, advanced uh, you know chips you know uh, within one country. You know you can see the, the rise of Taiwan Taiwanese companies, the rise the rise of uh, Dutch companies. You know in the, in these you know uh, uh, games, but then and there is another story I would wish to tell is that. Although you can see that there is heavy regulation in you know uh, big tech in China, but also if you when it comes to electric co companies or electric car industry in China, you can see that the Chinese government has been providing so much support. For example, through a state subsidy, um, there's a one city that you must visit, or there's one uh, electric car company that you must pay attention to. This is. City is called Shenzhen, where Anupam and I visited back in 2019. And then uh, this company, Shenzhen based company BYD. Now, the sale of BYD electric car has surpassed uh, Tesla. And the marginal, uh, the, I think that profit margin that this company is also uh, outpaced uh, Tesla. Um, so, this is, but the growth of this company actually has. Similar to a large extent, of course, this is a great company, a lot of innovation, but status support played a major role. But there's one interesting story I want to share. If you go to Shenzhen, you can see that uh, taxis there, uh, taxi cars there, there's only one brand, BYD. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, there was this kind of you know, citywide uh, you know, kind of, uh, plan to purchase uh, BYD's electric cars. In the name of certain environmental protection, in the name of promoting, you know, uh, electric car industry in uh, Shenzhen, I mean, so this kind of you know, state support is obvious and widespread. Um, um, but then, when I was visiting uh, Munich for the very first time, I saw that oh my God! You know, for the very first time, there is this one city with one single brand, you know, for. Uh, taxi uh, cars and um, Mercedes Benz. I was shocked. This is luxurious car brand, but how come it, it was serviced? <coughs> taxi cars, excuse me, taxi cars use the one single brand, Mercedes Benz. But I re later on I realized it must, it must be you know, achieved through a uh, market based arrangement. But back in you know, Shenzhen, you can see that you know, there was sort of, you know, very firm and strong. Uh, state support fostering and promoting electric car industry in China. So I would say this kind of national champion uh, strategy is very complicated in China. Market oriented practices, state support, state regulation. But when it comes to various kind of you know uh, national interest, I think for the time being, the most important you know thing is the this kind of national interest or how we can. You know, so you know, make this uh, authoritarian regime sustainable. So, regulation of social media platform at the same time, uh, you know, promotion of uh, electric car industry, and I think this the the the, the, the picture there is so interesting. Um, Questions in the room. Hi, thank you so much for being here and for the talk. Can I ask you to just identify yourself? Yeah, yes, yes. My name is Giovanna. I'm an LM student at the law school. And I'm curious to um, ask if you could like share a little bit more 
um, about the choices to um, about trade regulation and data localization as the two last parts of the book. If this was a solution to making a more interoperable and like divided power and kind of, kind of like try to break the super um, nations, or if this was just a way of um, showing what is currently happening and the um, promises and challenges of this both kind of like solutions in a way. Um, so let me um, try to answer that. Um, so the book has a variety of views on the question of data localization. Um, and so you've got Graham Greenleaf, um, and who's probably a little bit more sympathetic to data localization. You've got uh, K.S. Park, Kempson Park. Um, uh, so Graham, Graham is a professor in Australia. Uh, Kempson is a professor at, at Pre University Law School. Um, and you've got others, uh, Neha, Mishra, uh, graduate student in Geneva, um, and uh, you've got uh, uh, Doug Arner running the organization, yeah. uh, one of Pageant's colleagues at University of Hong Kong. Uh, so, so there are a variety of views in, in, in the book. Um, I'll just say my views uh, on this question because it's just it's a complicated terrain. Uh, I, I've seen digitalization as really a, kind of uh, the uh, 21st century of uh, 20th century uh, industrial policy, which is you know build your uh, factories here, uh, you know we we won't will stop the imports from coming in. Uh, you know India did this for much of its uh, early uh, you know for its first 50 years of uh, development, uh, and so uh, and. As I try to hint at before, as I said before, I haven't seen that as a very successful strategy um, historically. Um, and maybe the maybe there's something different today about digitalization as opposed to uh, uh, make, kicking out uh, you know, foreign companies uh, uh, on the digital space may be different than kicking them out in uh, the uh, industrial uh, space. Uh, and I think those are important questions to ask. I'm not convinced. So the first, a few few quick points here. Data localization means put this you know, huge facility on the ground somewhere in your country. Okay, what is the you know if you've ever visited one of these data centers, how many people do you meet? Um, it's it's a handful of people, um, and what is the investment? It's it's not in the people. It's in the computers computer servers, the land, and the energy, okay? And it could be water supplies as well, right? Uh, and so those are the things you need. So energy and water tend to be very precious and, and rare commodities, especially in the developing world. Um, and so you're putting more strain on local uh, energy grid. It might not be as green as alternatives. So there's a climate change, there's a huge climate change aspect of all this which is what you'd like to do is put your cloud wherever it's the greenest. Okay, now, uh, so that would be ideal, right? Uh, data localization doesn't care if it's green, data localization says build it here. Uh, and so, so when people say, oh, this is a you know, billion dollar cloud center, most of that money is in the investment of the computers that go in there, which are imported from somewhere else. So, uh, so it's also part of the, you know, what is that billion dollars? Is that billion dollars going into the domestic economy? Typically not. Uh, it's, it's a huge kind of draw of energy and water in, in the local domain. So is that helping people? And then who's benefiting? Okay. Does the fact that your cloud sits here as opposed to there then create a local, uh, elect, you know, software industry based on the local cloud, it's not so clear, right? Uh, and so what you're doing is you're potentially raising the costs for your local software industry to access the cloud. Uh, so in many jurisdictions, like in Brazil, when you know Brazil thought about this, they looked and said, look, actually domestic cloud is much more expensive. Uh, and you've got a lot of companies saying, hey, if you force us to only source from the domestic cloud providers or force the foreigners to go domestic, you're actually reducing uh, our, you know, you're making things much more difficult for us. Uh, so, and then finally, in cybersecurity, you know, by 
kicking out um, uh, lots of companies by reducing competition, I think you ultimately harm cybersecurity. Uh, so I think in a variety of measures, the organization is not a, a, a great policy. I've actually described in a, in a new paper uh, I'm working on that the organization is getting much worse because now it's not only kicking out, uh, uh, it's, it's basically saying you not only have to look at, localize here, but you have to localize here on local companies. Uh, so you can't be AWS and build a, a cloud locally. You, ha you can't just, you can't be AWS at all. It can't be Microsoft, it can't be Apple, it can't be Google or Oracle. Um, and that I think is even, even more costly uh, uh, approach to all this. Uh, my name is Ping Wei. I'm business business scholar of uh, Harvard Law School's so football clinic. So I have a question for Professor Shang. So uh, I agree with you say that uh, uh, because China has built a wall, therefore foreign company cannot re-enter, really and then a, a Chinese domestic uh, internet company scale up. But I think there is an, ex an exception. Uh, Amazon did arrive in China very early at a very early stage. And was allowed even by the domestic company, right? And in that scenario, there was no war, you know, apply, right? So, but but then you'll find that Amazon does not really survive as a as a giant in China. So uh, then someone said it must has you know it has to do with the fact that you know uh, the Chinese industry, I mean the internet industry, probably you know it developed with its own Chinese characteristic. I just want to know uh, your perspective on this regard. Also related, um, but probably a little bit tougher. So um, since China and the United States now competing with each other in the AI uh, sector, which is kind of a next chapter of uh, digital sovereignty, I would say. So in this regard, I just want your comments. Who will find it when from your prediction? Thank you. Well, Thank you so much. These are great questions, and these are really, really great questions. Um, so let me try to uh, respond to the first question. I, you know, so let me quickly ask the you know, audience here. How many of you know Pinduoduo, another you know, e-commerce company, and its application here are called Tamu? OK, great. So I think there is a story behind uh, the competition, you know, uh, between Amazon and a uh, variety of uh, e-commerce platforms in China. Um, as you rightly pointed out, uh, China allowed Amazon to do business in China. So I think e-commerce was fine at the, at the time, but if you want to say both things, it was not, you know, okay in China, but, you know, put, you know, so spending money is fine, okay with Chinese government, okay? But if you want to speak in something loud in on the social media platform, though, so for example, through Google or Facebook was not allowed. So that, that was the difference, right? Okay, so uh, money was not an issue. We welcome, you know, that they welcome money, okay? So that's the thing and why uh, Amazon was, uh, you know, permitted to do business in China. Uh, although I'm not sure whether uh, CEO of Amazon had any special relationship with any top leaders in China. Uh, maybe he's, uh, he speaks Chinese or he's good at cooking Chinese food. Uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> but but uh, you can see that this kind of you know, uh, nature of the business, you know, uh, Amazon uh, ca has carried on in China. But unfortunately, this great, you know, American company, you know, and Amazon has done such a you know, a great job in the, this country and many, you know, uh, uh, country around the world, right? But surprisingly, I think Amazon, as you rightly pointed out, Amazon could not really compete well with uh, many other e-commerce uh, platforms in China, such as Alibaba's uh, Taobao and Tmall, uh, Pinduoduo, and, and also uh, 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 Jingdong, another major uh, e-commerce platform. I think culture is a big thing. Um, and also, you know, the, the kinds of services and, uh, the goods that they could provide is also another story. Uh, these are the major reasons I think Chinese platforms um, has won, uh, you know, in the competition. First of all, Chinese platforms know local culture very well. Um, they know 
customs preferences, what they exactly need needed, and also the the kind of the services and uh, the uh, goods that provide <coughs> is also uh, you know another cutting edge the Chinese company um, had when they were competing with Amazon because they they know how to source the most affordable products, the, you know, the products that they, uh, Chinese commerce customers need. For example, they launched this, this kind of, you know, uh, November 11th, this kind of, you know, shopping festival. They just exactly know how, you know, this kind of, Singles you know, Day. Singles Day. <laughs> uh, singles Day, you know, has this sort of, you know, animated people's interest in spending, of course, by offering really, really, you know, big discounts, but at the same time, they... So just, to, just, you know what Singles Day is, right? Singles Day is when you spend money on yourself, because you're yeah. single. Taking care of yourself. Uh, so, which is a great idea, right? It's, yeah. And it's one, 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 right? Yeah. The, November, the November. Yeah, exactly. It, I mean, like, utterly brilliant. It could have been done anywhere around the world, right? And so, <laughs> You know, brilliant Chinese yes. uh, you know e-commerce platform mm -hmm. creates this for and creates the like you know phenomenal shopping uh, yeah. day for for the country. So uh, as uh, Anupam aptly pointed out, so if you want to do well, I mean the best if you want to do business well in China, you not only need to know local culture very well, but also you know you have to sort of know uh, you know find the best of you know business practices, right? Uh, at the same time, as to the AI question, again, this is such a big question, uh, and I, I think this is the, the ultimately the, the, the you know uh, the most uh, important question these days. Um, unfortunately, we actually have multiple ch chapters in the book talking about this um, um, you know AI thing. And for example, Andrew Woods has a chapter dealing with uh, the rise of AI and how especially data training process, how the various uh, countries deal with uh, data training for uh, the development of AI technology. So if you're interested, you can um, <coughs> read that chapter. I strongly recommend it. But as to the rivalry, uh, AI rivalry between United States and China, I, as far as I know, um, you can see that there are two critical things that um, this wall uh, will turn out to be. One is, I, I would say, hardware, as you pointed out earlier, computers and all kinds of things. So now computers and what, uh, you know, are you know, one thing, but the trips, you know, are the really important uh, you know, matters as well. So, but then you can see that when it comes to AI, who controls trips? It is this country and also Taiwan. Okay, so now, for example, NVIDIA's uh, uh, you know, uh, GPU is really dominating this uh, you know, uh, landscape. Um, so then there comes this kind of export ban imposed by the Biden uh, administration, as you know. Um, so the hardware side, I think China is not doing well. Um, it cannot uh, you know, produce um, chip, chips that that are equivalent to NVIDIA's you know, GPU. When it comes to data, as I said, data is another critical thing uh, to deal with the AI development. Here in this country, I think there is not strong regulation when it comes to uh, collection and usage of data. So that's why AI companies can scrap so much information from the internet, ways that you don't really know, okay? Um, but in China, the to a certain extent, you know, collection and use of data is not that much regulated. But but then you can see that the state actually heavily heavily regulated the, the way that people can speak and the way that tech companies can uh, collect and use use uh, data as well. And when it comes to data localization, I think this is a, one of the best examples. Uh, Chinese companies has such strict rules dealing with data localization. And also, I think the diversity of data is very important. The, uh, the, the amount of data you have is one thing, but the diversity of data that it, you know, is another thing. And we need to have you know, various kinds of data can train AI models well. Okay? But then I, I can see that Chinese company lacks this kind of 
diversity because of one of the reasons is exactly about the uh, great wall that China has uh, built upon. So they uh, Chinese tech companies may have difficulty in uh, you know accessing and uh, utilizing foreign data and uh, um, you know as I mentioned uh, so there are various reasons for uh, making uh, data divert. So I can see that China is not doing well in competing with the United States in this kind of a grand AI war uh, for these kind of major two major reasons. But I cannot predict who will win because so far you can see that who is winning, but we don't know what will happen in China in the future. Uh, so uh, I would say um, now we have these two major players indeed in the AI sector. Unfortunately, we don't have any big tech company in the European Union. Sadly, there are no big player in Japan as well. Um, so uh, I hope the two big giants will competing ethically and peacefully. We don't, we don't need to see another third world war because of the AI rivalry. We're a little past time. Um, I don't know if you, might, if you have any final remarks or questions you wanted to uh, end with. I could carry on all day, but I will not do that to you because I know your places to be. I, you know, this has been a wonderful way to skim the surface of the book. I hope that all of you got an idea of why I think it's so wonderful and that you will take the time to read it. And I hope for your sakes that you will run into these two brilliant authors again, as I fortunately will for sure this year. I know when I'm going to see both of them uh, uh, so that you can continue the conversation. But it's honestly, it is such a rich book and it asks and answers questions that I think are so under discussed. So thank you both for writing the book, but also for giving me the privilege of, of uh, having this conversation with you. Thank you, Shinmai. I'm going to just uh, quickly end with two quick comments. One, um, I wanted to commend a particular paper in the book by Liz Liu. Uh, and Barry Weingast. It's on Taobao. Yeah. Um, and basically it says Taobao created its, created its own legal system. Um, and that was one of the reasons it succeeded in China. Uh, and so uh, it's a brilliant uh, you know, retelling of w why one particular platform beat out Amazon. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so just a, just a fascinating point. Um, so second, um, uh, I'll, I'll make three quick points. Temu, uh, which Hao Chen mentioned, is now come under uh, national sc security scrutiny in the United States. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so you know this e-commerce app uh, selling you know household goods is being reviewed for national security uh, concerns. And this is you know I, I in the last couple of years there is some of this in the book already. The national security turn in all of this. Uh, digital sovereignty is more and more about national sovereignty. Finally, uh, on the AI and, uh, and uh, a question that you asked and, and uh, digital sovereignty, uh, Houchin uh, hinted at the concern that the generative AI would say unkind things about the Chinese government. Uh, well, this is a concern that not, that's not, not only shared by, uh, you know, clearly authoritarian governments. This is a concern shared by governments across the world um, and, uh, and politicians across the world, certainly. Um, so uh, 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 you, you saw yesterday an announcement in India of uh, a kind of rule that said, if you have untested models, uh, AI models, that are, they have to be approved by the government before they're released. Well, this kind of coincided with news reports a couple of weeks ago that uh, uh, that someone had asked, uh, I think it's Gemini, Google's Gemini, uh, is Modi fascist? Okay, and it had given a possible plausible answer saying, you know, there are some aspects of this, etc. You know how uh, you, you can imagine the voice of uh, the chatbot. Uh, in this. And so the coincidence between this is not, I think, pure coincidence. Just again, tell you, you know, this is, these are concerns that we should have across the world um, in every jurisdiction. I know that uh, Modi tends, you know, we can 
whether or not he's democratic or not is an open question, etc. He's certainly very popular uh, thus far. Uh, but uh, so it's a, it's a, uh, so these are really difficult issues across the world. All right. Well, I hope you guys will join me in thanking uh, our guests today. And we have a, a bunch of speaker series events and workshops happening over the next couple of weeks. So we uh, hope to see you guys uh, either in person or, or joining virtually. But thanks, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Bye.